Good evening. Uh, it's 7.30 in Dhaka. A lot of people are already in, so we will get started. Uh, this is SK Ghosh. I would uh, like to welcome each and every one of you to this continuation of our training and capacity building program of uh, component S9 of the of Rajuk's Urban Resilience Project. Uh, we are continuing with what we have called the structural series, although today's lecture is geotechnical. The topic, as you see, is geotechnical design of foundations, provisions in BNBC 2020. Extremely important topic. And <clears throat> I am delighted that uh, Professor Zainul Abidin has agreed to provide today's instruction. I uh, personally am looking forward to it. Uh, I'm sure all of you know him. He was a longtime professor at the UET, now at the at, at MIST, uh, the, the the military institute. Uh, in in addition to being a great teacher, I have found him to be a wonderful man and have become uh, genuinely fond of him. Uh, I, I, I really am very happy that, that he will be speaking to us today. I'm sure all of you will benefit a great deal uh, with that. Uh, Professor Abedin, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ghosh, uh, for all the good words about me. Uh, I believe everybody of you are actually hearing me loudly. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Myself is Professor Abidin, as introduced by Dr. Ghosh, and I am now working for Military Institute of Science and Technology, and happened to be, I was the team leader of the group of consultants for the preparation of BNBC 2020. I invite you all to this component of the lecture series on BNBC 2020, as told by Dr. Ghosh, today's topic would be soils and foundations. So uh, it is actually included in uh, part six in volume two of BNVC 2020. The yeah. designation of the chapter, uh, the, the whole part is structural design. Money. I think it should have been structural and geotechnical designs. Okay. So it is maybe yeah. the, in the okay. next version, it would be corrected. So I'll go by these slides. So if you look into the, uh, what is called this organization of the chapter three, organization of the chapter, it actually includes uh, three divisions, division A, division B, and division C. Division A, it is the definitions, site investigation, soil classification, material and foundation types. Division B, it is the service load design method of foundations, and division C, it is the additional consideration in planning, design, and construction of building foundations. And then we have actually five appendices. This is the appendix D, method of soil exploration, sampling, and ground measurement. Appendix E, recommended criteria for identification and classification of expansive soil. Appendix F, it is the construction of pile foundation. Appendix G, it is the other methods of estimating ultimate uh, uh, axial capacity of piles and drill shafts. And Appendix D, e, H, as usual, is the reference for this chapter. So let's look into the scope of this chapter. It is a bit unusual. It, it is said like this, the provisions of the chapter shall be applicable to the design and construction of foundations of buildings and structures for the safe support of dead and superimposed loads without exceeding the allowable bearing stresses, permissible settlement and design capacity. This is okay. But the next statement is that because of uncertainties of randomness involved in subsoil characteristics, geotechnical engineering requires a high degree of engineering judgment. And as such, the code provisions of this chapter provided here under are kept elaborative for better understanding of the readers and provisions that are stated in the imperative form using shell are mandatory. Only where shell is mentioned, it is mandatory. Otherwise, other provisions of the chapter should be followed using some sound 
geotechnical engineering judgment. You see, the word is geotechnical engineering judgment. If we are to do this, we must have actually some basic knowledge about geotechnical engineering or soil mechanics. So I believe you all of know all these things, but for the uh, ease of discussion, I will actually, what is called this, arrange my uh, today's lecture like this. Sorry. So the pr proceedings of the lecture would be like this. Uh, I will go through some basic basics of soil mechanics. As you know, the soil mechanics is a subset of the broad subject of geotechnical engineering. And some of the provisions of the code would be included already uh, over here. And then we have selected code provisions for division A, selected code provision for division B. I will not be discussing all the items because we don't, we have actually limitations of time. And then some of the uh, code provisions of division C and also I will uh, discuss something for appendices. So, So what I do, I will actually mention about all the sections provided in the soils and foundation chapter, even though I don't discuss with them, discuss them, but to be familiar with this code provisions for soils and foundation, I think I will mention it. And if it is omitted, I move it very quickly. So now the, it is the chapter which is soils and foundation. Sorry for the very basic, basic things. I, I, I believe you, everybody you know it, but it is for the, for the betterment of the discussion or for the betterment of understanding. By definition, soil is considered to include all natural occurring loose or soft deposit overlying solid bedrock. It is formed by the disintegration and decomposition of rock. The, uh, the term is known as weathering. It can also be formed by decomposition of organic matter. I started with this very basic definition. The reason is that there are so many complexities in soil mechanics, unlike other mechanics. So we are saying that whatever a loose material overlying a bedrock, this is a bedrock and overlying material, we call it soil. But there are some definitions as well, as because it is used by some other professionals as well. For agriculturists, they are also called soil. It is the top portion of the of, of the ground surface, and they are actually responsible for the uh, growth of the plant. But we are not really interested in the growth of the plant. Rather, what we, we do, the soil as defined by the agriculturist, for us it is the top soil. And before going for any construction, usually we remove this top soil. Could you get my point? And also. From geologist's geo point of view, some other definition they call mental and all these things saprolite. But we are interested in that naturally occurring loose or soft deposit overlying solid bedrock. It is formed by the disintegration of, of rock. It can also be formed by the decomposition of organic matter. So from the definition, you could easily see that soil basically is of two types. Number one, it is inorganic soil. And number two, it is the organic soil. Could you get my point? So weathering, uh, as you know, the all type of, uh, there are three types of weathering, physical, chemical, and biological. I, I, I'm mentioning all these simple things over there because they are actually responsible for the complexities of soil. So we have three types of weathering, physical, chemical, and biological. All the agents are over there, it is mentioned. For example, periodical temperature changes, wedging action, hydration, dehydration, all these things are coming. But for the, disintegration, uh, for the disintegration of rock, two things are very, very important. Number one, precipitation and temperature. So precipitation, it is the annual rainfall. So there is a chart over there. It is annual rainfall. This is the main annual temperature. And if you have, say, annual rainfall of 100 centimeter and temperature is 10, 20, then it will have moderate chemical weathering. The, 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 the thing is that, Whenever chemical weathering would be there, the particles form would be smaller in size, usually fine grain. And if it is physical weathering, it will actually form the coarse grain soil. So now, uh, if we look into the earth mass, our earth mass actually consists of three major layers. Whenever we are considering uh, the, the material by which it is formed or by the 
what is called this uh, mineral by which it is formed. We actually call crust, mantle, and core. You everybody know it. We have actually three types of rock: igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. We have some some information over there. If we consider the crust volume, then 95% of the crust is formed of igneous rock. But if we look into the surface of the earth, 80% of the surface is formed of red sedimentary uh, rock, and others are metamorphic rocks. Again, rocks are formed of different minerals, you know. So we have actually more than 4,000 minerals, and of which we are fortunate enough, of which only eight are responsible for the for formation of rock. Do you get my point? So rock is, again, the mineral is formed of different elements. We have actually 118 elements, and 98% of the earth crust is made of eight elements. So can you get my point? So rock is, the soil is formed by the weathering of rock. Rock is formed of different minerals. Minerals are formed of different animals, elements. I think you already know the difference between rock and mineral. Mineral has got a definite chemical structure, and we call it actually crystalline structure or something like this. But it can be expressed by chemical formula, but rock, uh, also, it is a solid metal, but it cannot be uh, uh, defined by a chemical formula. That is the difference between these two. So we have, say, this is uh, earth crust. So we have actually mantle over there. It is crust. This is mantle. This is core. We are actually, what is called this, uh, dealing with this very small portion, you know. This is actually approximately 20 kilometer. It is something, the example is that it is like the skin of the onion, you know. The onion skin is very, very thin, and uh, the surface uh, of the earth, earth uh, we are dealing with, it, it is something like this, very small portion, several hundred meters or something like this. So then, uh, this, is the, this is all the chemical formulas for the minerals. You see there is minerals over here, quartz, feldspar, mica, ampoule, pyroxene, olivine, clay, and carbonate. I am giving emphasis on the mineral clay. So we have actually clay size particle. Whenever we define the soil in terms of particle size, then we have clay size particle. But there is another, this is actually clay mineral. And usually there are three, many types of clay mineral of which three types of minerals are important, kaolinite, elite, and monborionite. We have to know this because these are actually, this will actually create some problems within the soil mass. These are actually sometimes, some of them are very, very problematic. Whenever you, you learn how to dry it, then definitely you know the how to start and also you have to know how to stop. So whenever we will be dealing with this geotechnical engineering or the foundation problem, we must know who are the actually problematic soils. So that's why I, we are mentioning over here that there is another mineral, we call it clay mineral. So the clay soil, which is formed from clay mineral, is could be quite different from clay size particle. Could you get my point? So these are the elements over there, oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium, of which 46% is the oxygen, silicon is 28%. So you could easily understand that a vast portion of the soil is formed by these uh, two components. So we have other potassium, calcium, magnesium, iron, and aluminum. These are the basic things. I, I think everybody of you actually know this. Again, if we consider the clay mineral, so it is a, a, a the particle is formed from some basic, what is called at, 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 atomic structure. So first one, we call it actually silicon tetrahedron. Silicon tetrahedron in its formation, it has got one silica. It is surrounded by four oxygen. So it, it is something like this. It is, uh, it, we call it actually tetrahedron. So then another one is aluminum octahedron. So the inner one is aluminum or magnesium. The outer one is hydroxyl. These are the hydroxyl. So this is the actually uh, what is called the formation of uh, clay mineral, how it is formed. This is the tetrahedron is the unit. Could you follow me? So several units, they form to make sheet. And several sheets, they actually make clay particle. 
So it is becoming complex and complex and complex. So it, you see over here, this is unit. Then they are forming some chain. This is actually, we call it sheet. This is unit. The several uh, units are combined together. We call it sheet. And these sheets, maybe this is at the top. This is at the middle. This is again at the bottom. It will form some sort of uh, soil particle, clay particle. If the arrangement is different, the different clay particle would be formed. Would you get my point? So over here it is written like this: one silica and four oxygen, it forms tetrahedron unit. Tetrahedron unit and tetrahedron unit, it forms silica sheet. One aluminium or magnesium ion plus six hydroxyl, it will form octahedron unit. Aluminium octahedron and aluminium octahedron. That means the if the inside one is aluminium, then it will form gypsite shape. And magnesium octahedron and magnesium octahedron, it will form actually bucite shape. So various combination of seeds, it can form actually different types of clay mineral. And that's why clay are normally known as actually layered uh, soil system. So if you look into the electron micro, uh, micrograph of clay mineral, this is you see it is the it is the formation of kaolinite. This is actually elite. This is montmorillonite, of which this is the most problematic one. Because whenever it is coming in contact with water, it is ex it will expand in volume, and we call it expansive soil. So this is the mineral clay mineral, which is actually Mount Morironite. Okay, uh, let's go for the classification of the soil because in this chapter uh, the class uh, the, the 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 thing classification is mentioned over there. So, depending on origin or depositional mode, soil can be broadly classified into two groups. One is inorganic soil, and inorganic soil could be both coarse grain and fine grain. And uh, physical and chemical weathering are responsible for that. It is weathering is happening because of disintegration of rock. And organic soil usually fine grain, and remains mixed with inorganic fine grain soil. It can be it is. Usually, it does not mix with what is called coarse grain soil. So, if we look into the classification of the soil, whenever there is any classification, there must be some criteria. I always tell my students that you cannot, if, even if I ask you the, how many types of humankind are over there, you cannot straight away answer the uh, questions. You can say male and female, female and male. You can say black and white, you can say long and short, so many things. So whenever there is any classification, there must be criteria. So we have actually four important criteria depending on which soil can be classified. Number one, classification based on origin or deposition. Classification based on grain size. Classification based on cohesive properties. And classification based on use, we usually call it engineering classification. So these are the four classification criteria. So if we look into the organic soil, because I want to finish this one first, because this is a problematic soil. The, the, the saying about problematic soil is that avoidance is the best solution. If you can avoid it, that is the best solution. Next best solution is that you have to treat the soil with something so that it could gain some stiffness and you can use as a foundation material. So organic soil, whenever the organic content is less than 5%, the behavior of that organic soil is something like inorganic soil. Could you get my point? So we call it organic soil. Straight away, it is inorganic soil. If the organic content is 6 to 20%, then as it is, it, it remains mixed with silt and clay. If it, it mixed with silt, we call it organic silt. That means, say, 15% organic material and less rest as seal, we call it organic seal. Otherwise, if it is clay, then we call it organic clay. In soil mechanics, if we, we, we are to qualify some material, what we used to do? What we used to do? Usually, we use two or three words. The last word is noun. It is, it is like in English grammar, good boy, bad boy. So organic seal, it does mean, basically it is seal, but it is mixed with organic soil. 
and uh, if it is in between 21 to 74 percent then the organic material is prominent we call it silty organic soil or we call it clay organic soil but whenever the organic content is greater than 75 percent we call it peat soil and peat soil is highly unreservable soil for the construction of any foundation on so it contains very high natural moisture content so up to 1500 percent it could go and it has got high compressibility it has got very low shear strength in natural condition so uh, this classification uh, uh, for the time being i want to finish it uh, over here then i move to the next one inorganic soil whenever the inorganic soil is formed by the disintegration of rock and if it used to stay on the parent rock we call it residual soil but if it is transported to somewhere else we call it actually transported soil could you get my point so transported soil could be it is depending on the mode of transportation the property of the transported soil also could be different it can be transported by water it can be transported by glacier can be by wind or can be by gravity so if we have a very uh, what is called first glance over there so it, it is staying on the parent rock so it, it can be it is usually reddish in color and we can call it laterite whenever the particles are coarse grain, lateritic whenever it is fine grain, and we could have also another type of soil, it is black in color, and it, 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 it is a, incidentally, cotton grows very well over there. That's why the name is black, black cotton soil. But it is expensive in nature because it contains, it is the clay mineral which is Montmorillonite. Could you get my point? That's why I mentioned over here, that there is a different types of minerals we should call it clay mineral very quickly water transported soil alluvial soil lacustrine soil marine soil and marl these are the prominent soils some other soils are also there alluvial soil it is actually depositing in running water condition for example if it is depositing under river bed we call it alluvial soil if it is still water then we call it lacustrine soil similarly saline water we call it marine soil marl we have some glacier transported soil we, at the moment uh, in, in case of Bangladesh is quite unlikely that we will be getting this sort of soil. But these are the names for this glacier transported soil. Again, we could have actually a wind transported soil. The common name is Eolin soil. And it is if the particles are uh, silty size. Sorry, I didn't mention about this classification yet. Depending on the grain size, as you know, the soil can be classified as gravel, sand, silt, and clay. So for the time being, I'm uh, I'm actually using this using these words, but later on we will be discussing about the particle size. So whenever the particle size is silty, we call it Lewis, and if it is sandy, we call it dune, and if it is volcanic ash, we call it actually tough. So this type of soil usually it can actually wind can carry wind cannot actually carry the larger particles so louis the property is such whenever it is dry it is very very strong but whenever it gets gets saturated it will just flow and we call it mud flow so this is another problematic soil we call it collapsible soil so by this time we have we have got this organic soil which is problematic we have got expansive soil which is problem problematic and some other soils are also there we will be discussing later so three types of soil already we got it problematic soil then gravity transported soil usually it is colloidal soil the other name is actually tell us perhaps you everybody you know this but still for the sake of discussion we are doing that now the second classification scheme classification based on particle size so only we are considering particle size it can be formed by, from the quartz it can be formed from clay mineral it can be formed from anything else but we only depend on what is called particle size depending on particle size it is say gravel sand seal and clay size we are only mentioning here size could you get my point so there are various classification agencies we have actually ASTM, we have ASTO, we have USCS, Unified Soil Classification System, we have MIT Classification System, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, that was actually adopted by British Standard Institution, so this is also BS classification, 
and we have our own classification bnvc classification so if we look into this it is something like this you see this classification is based on the particle size only in astm they tell that okay whenever your particle size is less than 0 0.075 millimeter it is actually fine particles do you get my point and if it is more than that we call it coarse particles so basic classification is four gravel sand silt and clay but there are some sub classification over there could you get my point so according to them silt size and uh, clay size particle differentiate is the size 005 millimeter and, uh, uh, that means whenever it is less than 0 0.005 we call it clay but if it is less than 0 0.001 then we call it colloid could you get my point so from there, from 0.75 to 4.75 millimeter, it is sand. Then 4.75 and above, generally speaking, it is gravel. But gravel, you can actually further classify it as cobalt and boulder. So if it is 75 millimeter, that means 3 inch. And to 12 inch, we call it co cobalt. And otherwise, it is boulder. So other classifications, slight differences are there. I'll just move to BNBC classification, what BNBC says. So according to ASTM and according to ESTO, clay size particle is 0 0.005 millimeter. But in our classification, we, uh, we take it as 0 0.002 millimeter. This is, uh, this is also taken by uh, what is called this British standard and MIT. So silt is from 0 0.002 to 0 0.075. We have to keep in mind, these classifications are basically based on the sieve size. As you know, we have actually different sets of sieve to classify the, or to classify the soil uh, uh, depending on particle size. We have number four sieve, which is 4.75 millimeter. We have number 10 sieve, we have two millimeter. We have number 40 sieve, it is 0.425 millimeter. We have 200 sieve, it is 0 0.075 millimeter. So whenever you are expressing it by number, it does mean Per linear inch, we have actually such number of divisions. For example, if we say to 10 inch, it does mean in a square of this mesh, we have 10 into 10 hundreds square divisions are over there. Could you get my point? So theoretically, what happens if it is actually per one inch, if 10 divisions are there, so one division should be 2.54 millimeter. But as we are considering the mesh wire over there, that's why it is actually two millimeter. So this is the procedure. This is a very basic thing. I, I, I think you already know it. In our case, you see, sand, we can classify it into three groups, coarse, medium, and fine. Gravel, again, three, coarse, medium, and fine. We have cobalt, 75, so uh, it is uh, 300 millimeter. We call it actually boulder, and then three to... 12, we call it actually cobalt. Could you get my point? So you have to remember that clay size particle in our case is 0 0.002 millimeter. Okay. Let's move, uh, move to the next classification. Uh, as you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, soils are formed of different minerals. For example, quartz is a mineral, clay is also a mineral. But in nature, what could happen? Soil could be actually mixed in various proportion, but uh, we actually consider one thing, depending on the cohesive properties, I can tell you the story a bit later on, what does it mean by actually cohesion? If a soil doesn't have any cohesion, we call it cohesion-less soil. If it has got cohesion, we call it actually cohesive soil. Could you get my point? And if it has got both, we call it actually C5 soil. So these are the classification based on what is called these uh, 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 the cohesive properties. So we have already finished three classification based on deposition, classification based on particle size, classification based on uh, what is called this cohesive properties. So now uh, the most important one is that it is the engineering classification of soil. We sometimes call it it is classification based on use. So we have actually two widely accepted classification scheme. It is 
actually it is adopted by so many standards. BNB also adopted these two classifications. Number one, unified soil classification system. Number two, ESTO soil classification system. Don't be confused. They have also particle size classification, but they have also engineering classification, two classifications over there. Could you get my point? So in doing that, whenever we will be we will be going for unified soil classification system or ESTO soil classification system, we have to do some some test. Unless you do the test, as it is engineering classification of soil, we cannot use some qualitative words. We have to use quantitative things. That means I can say it is good student. It is a qualitative things. But if I say he is a student, obtain 90% of the marks or obtain A plus, definitely he is a good student and quantified. Would you get my point? So unified soil classification system and astro soil classification system, we usually quantify the things so that we could develop a classification scheme and that should be the language of the engineers all over the world. Would you get my point? So we have to do certain tests. That test includes, uh, basically, we call, call them classification tests. So there are two classification tests. Number one, grain size analysis, and number two, consistency test. So the we will be getting some numerical values from there. So numerical results of this classification test are usually known as index properties of soil. Could you get my point? So whenever we'll be getting some values from here, we call it index properties of the soil. So let's see the grain size analysis and consistency test. Uh, sorry for that, I am discuss, uh, discussing all the very basic things. You might be very, very bored about that, but it is for the sake of continuity. I, I, I tell you so many times. So grain size analysis actually could be of basically two types. We, we do the grain size by using a set of sieves. We call it sieve analysis. We could have also sedimentation analysis Whenever we have actually more than 10% of the material finer than 200 sieve. That means if you take 100 grams of soil and if more than 10% of the soil is of smaller size, that is smaller than 0 0.075 millimeter, then we have to go for sedimentation analysis. Because by using the sieve, we cannot analyze this thing. Because the opening already so small. You see, this is 200 by 200 sieve. It is so fine because in a square inch, there is 200 by 200 such number of uh, uh, what is called this opening. That means it is something like our hair, the width of our hair. It is, it is so fine. So if we make the sieve further fine, it would be clogged. And that's why depending on the Stokes law, we determine how much percentages of the particles of what size are there. That means we are determining the particle size, which is less than 0 0.075 millimeter. Uh, something like this. Say 0 0.075 millimeter particle is 15%, of which some particles could be less than 0 0.001 as well. So we have to do this classification or something like this from sedimentation analysis. Sedimentation analysis could be of two types. Number one is the hydrometer analysis, and number two, it is pipette analysis. So hydrometer, as you know, perhaps that there are two types of hydrometer. One is measuring the, 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 the density of water mixed with soil. That means in hydrometer test, what we used to do, the, we take the soil sample passing number 200. Say 50 gram of soil sample, we take it, we mix it with uh, one liter of water, and then we make a soil suspension. Would you get my point? So it is the soil suspension and with time, we determine the density of this uh, or density of that particular uh, particular soil suspension. You could easily understand that the, the density of the of the of, of the of that soil suspension would be higher whenever time is zero. But with time, the larger particle would be dropped down, and we could determine the size of the particle from using certain formula there. So this one is measuring the density. But this one a bit smart hydrometer, 1 to 152 H. And in a particular time, how many grams of soils are there in the suspension, it measures that one. Could you get my point? So who are actually the people who are actually responsible 
uh, for the geotechnical investigation, you must actually keep in your, in your mind that wh which hydrometer you are being uh, you are going to use. If you use this one, it has got a different formula. If you use this one, this is this is the uh, pipette analysis is not very very common in engineering. Some other people, the agriculturists and some other people, they could use this one. So whenever we we do sieve analysis or hydrometer analysis, if we do both. Then using both the data, we could get a curve. We call it combined grain size analysis. Could you get my point? So, if we draw the combined grain size analysis, this is a, a it is a it is a graph plotted in a semi-log graph paper. In x-axis it is particle size, in y-axis it is percent finer. Percent finer means it is something like this. For example, you are actually sieving a soil, 100 gram of soil, by using sieve number four. So if 60% uh, is retained on 4 and 40% passes, then we call percent finer as 40. It is something like this. So we, we use a set of shapes. For example, we use 4, 8, 10, 30, 40, 50, 100, and 200. So all the sieve we use, and we also use hydrometer. We get a grain size curve like this. Perhaps you, everybody of you know. From this grain size analysis, we have to find three values over there for engineering classification. One is D10. We call it effective size. D10, it does mean it is the size of the particle from which 10% of the material is finer. I just give a very wild example. Huh? For example, in a gathering of 100 people, say, 10% of the people, their height is less than 5 feet, okay? So, then we, ca we, we call D10 is equal to 5. Or H10, if you measure the height, we call H10 is equal to 5. So, from grain size analysis, corresponding to 10% finer, the diameter which is coming from here, from x-axis, we call it D10. Similarly, we have D30. That means it is the size of the particle from which 30% is finer. And D60, we call it, it is the size of the particle from which 60% is finer. Could you get my point? So by using these two, three values, we can get two coefficients. Uh, the, 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 this is some sort of index properties as well. Cu, we call it uniformity coefficient. It is equal to D60 by D10. And this is the higher the value, the more is the spread of the curve. For example, the curve could be like this. The curve could be also like this. Whenever all sizes of particles are present over there in a, in, in a soil mass, we usually consider that one a well-graded soil because that is a better material for the foundation to uh, support. Could you get my point? Similarly, we'll be getting another curve, which is called it, it is a coefficient of gradation or coefficient of curvature. CC or CZ, it is D30 squared divided by D60 by D10. So these two values we will be using in the classification scheme. So we are getting two values from here, uniformity coefficient and coefficient of curvature. And again, the uh, fine grain soil, usually what happens, I tell you, in nature, all the surfaces, it can be surface of your body, it can be surface of a book, it can be surface of anything. It usually carries negative charges. It usually carries negative charges. And in nature, what water is a dipolar liquid. You know, water is a dipolar liquid because it is formed by oxygen and hydrogen. Oxygen is negatively char charged and so hydrogen is positively charged. Whenever it is positively charged, we call it actually cations. If it is negatively charged, we call it actually anion. So, again, soil particle, depending on the shape, can be actually three types of particle. Bulky, flaky, and needle shape. Would you get my point? Bulky means whenever three dimensions prominent, a big book, it has got actually length, width, and thickness. So we call it actually bulky particle. Flaky particle, say a page of paper. So it is page of paper, it does mean it doesn't have any thickness. It is not prominent. We call it actually flaky. And needle shape is 
one dimension is prominent, something like needle. Why, why we are interested in that? The reason is that when the, the, the surface is negative charge, whenever it is coming in contact with water, the positive hydrogen is attracting lot of lot of the particle. Do you get my point? So whenever the, the, the flaky particle is coming in contact with water, it will actually change its properties. So depending on this water content, that means fine particle will actually carry, it is what is called this, um, it charges most. For example, if you have a book, so book, what is happening? It has actually six surfaces. So six surfaces, it has got some sort, some amount of electrical charges. But if you disintegrate all the pages, you take it off, then all the pages, top and bottom, they are actually carries electrical charges. So as it is carrying electrical charges and whenever it would be coming in contact with water, it could actually attract a lot of water. Could you get my point? So depending on the presence of water, what is happening, a soil could have four states or condition, liquid, plastic, semi-solid, and solid. And not only fine particle, even the sandy particle, some of the sandy particle, which is actually uh, passing through four, four to see, they also carry some electrical charges. That's why I always keep in mind that we always do this. Uh, sorry, let me say, let me finish it first. So, liquid state, it does mean whenever a material or soil will flow on its own weight, we call it liquid. Whenever a soil can be remolded to any shape, we call it plastic. Whenever it is, it, can, it is remolded, but only with the development of cracks, we call it semi solid. Whenever it cannot be remolded, we call it solid. So there must be some three, four states in between. There must be three limiting water contents. That means we have a limiting water content between limit state and plastic state. We call it li liquid limit. That means if the if the water content is slightly high, it will go to liquid state. If it is slightly less, it will go to plastic state. Whenever it is in liquid state, there is no shear strength. Could you get my point? It is like fluid. But whenever it is plastic state, it will have some shear strength. So at liquid limit, we have a very small shear strength. So we have to determine this limit. The reason is that depending on that, I'll tell you later, that whenever we are going to design the structure or foundation, we have to always keep in mind two things. Number one, the design must be, uh, the, uh, design must be, uh, uh, design, uh, sorry, the structure should not fail or the foundation should not fail because of excessive shear and the foundation shouldn't fail because of excessive, what is called settlement or excessive deformation. If the liquid limit of a soil is high, usually that soil will undergo tremendous settlement. Would you get my point? That's why to identify, we have to determine these limits. And also to classify the soil, we have to determine this limit. So we have liquid limit, we have another limit, plastic limit and shrinkage limit. Another point you have to always keep in mind, particularly for the geotechnical investigators. Whenever you are doing the limit test, you must collect the soil sample from the field and you must dry it in the air. We must grind it to powder. We should mix it water and we keep it for at least 24 hours. Then we determine this limit values. Could you get my point? Never you should actually use use the open dye one, unless in some part, uh, other purposes it could be required. But generally we have to determine this liquid limit in what is called this uh, air dried sample. This I, I think in 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 code it is mentioned somewhere. So I told you before that the, there are three shapes. It is the bulky, flaky, and needle shape. This bulky, flaky shape and needle shape usually it carries much of electrical charges. At, as a result of that, it has lot of water. So uh, usually because of lot of water, it changes its properties. Could you get my point? Whenever it is bulky, electrical charges they don't actually they cannot actually work uh, what is called prominently. The reason is that perhaps you know that we have between two particles, between two bodies, we have two types of forces. Eh? Number one, we call it body force. And number two, we call it van der Waal forces or bonding forces. So, yes, sorry. So, 
whenever it is bulky particle, surface charges are there. It could attract because of the presence of cation, but their body weight is so much, one particle cannot actually attract the other physically. But if you look at uh, flaky, for example, if you have some two polythene sheets, very polythene sheet, uh, thin polythene sheet, what happens because of the uh, uh, moisture of the atmosphere, these two are so attracted, even we, we find very diffi uh, difficulties in separating them. Do you get my point? So these particles uh, will have tremendous uh, what is called affinity for water, but, but bulky particle, uh, particles they don't have. Again, the property of the soil is also depend on the structure and fabric of the soil. That means structure and fabric of the soil mass. In a, in a, in whenever we are going to a particular site, not necessarily that only the what is called sandy particle would be there, only the silty particle would be there, but it is mixed. But these particles actually, they could actually form different types of structure. Arrangement of the particle could be different. So depending on that, we could have actually five structures, single grain structure, honeycomb structure, flocculated structure, dispersed structure, packet and pad. These three structures are for cohesive type of soil and this structure is for cohesionless soil. So this is actually for silty type of soil, honeycomb, honeycomb structure. So how it, how it looks like, let's see. So it is something like this. It, it is loose structure. This is loose structure. Uh, sorry, this is actually single grain structure. Single grain structure, if lot of voids are there, we call it loose. If it doesn't have any void, we call it dense. Similarly, honeycomb structure. What happens? Because of electrical charges, it forms chain like this. And again, another chain would be attracted by them. So it will actually have large void over there. We call it honeycomb structure. You see, whenever the soil was blown by air, we had actually three types of soil over there. We call it we call it actually Lewis and Dune. So that's Lewis structure, Lewis soil of this type of structure. That's why whenever it is coming in contact with water, it loses its structure. Lot of water would be entering over there. It loses its structure. Similarly, flaky particle could be like this, parallel like this because of electrical attraction. We call it dispersed structure. We call it structure like this, haphazard like this. We call it flocculated structure. And one, dis uh, one dispersed packet can be attracted by some other dispersed packet and we call it pad. The property of the soil will also depend on this type of thing. You see, we have to discuss actually a lot of things, but, but because of constraint of time, we cannot actually discuss this thing very elaborately. So I'll, uh, sorry for this. So we have, once we determine, we have actually three limits over there, liquid limit, plastic limit, and shrinkage limit. Once it is done, we could get some indices from there. The numerical difference from liquid, liquid limit and plastic limit, we call it plasticity index. This is very, very important index for the classification of the soil. If the liquid limit of the soil is say 60 and plastic limit of the soil is say 30, 35, then 60 minus 35, 25 is the plasticity index of the soil. Then depending on the, whether liquid limit and plasticity index and natural water content, we could have some other indices, that means liquidity index, and we have also consistency index. You see the formula, liquidity index means natural water content minus plastic limit divided by liquid limit minus plastic limit. That means whenever a soil has a water content liquid near to plastic limit or equal to plastic limit, this value is zero. So liquidity index zero means the soil is a plastic condition, it has already got some stiffness. But if it is in if the water content is like liquid limit, then liquid limit minus plastic, liquid limit minus plastic. So value would be getting one. So it is now already liquid. Would you get my point? So these are some indices. We could actually use it for the classification purpose or for our engineering judgment. As I told you that civil engineering or sorry, geotechnical engineering requires a lot of engineering judgment. It is not just the straightforward thing. So now we move to the engineering classification because we have already done the classification test. From there, we have uh, we, we have got some coefficient, we have got some uh, index. Using this index, we could classify the soil. Usually, 
in unified soil classification system let's move to the first one in unified soil classification system uh, what we used to do usually the soil is expressed by two letters first letter we have is uh, uh, over here it is it is a bit different first layer is letter is noun second letter is adjective unlike english grammar for example we have a soil gravel when it would be called gravel i'll tell you later if it is gravel and if it is well graded we designate this soil is gw could you get my point if it is sand and if it is poorly graded we call it gp now if a soil is mixed with say seal we call it gm you see g whenever it would be noun g means gravel s means sand m means seal because sand and seal start with the same s and that's why sealed m is m is there it is the swedish language mo is the sealed and that's why m is there c is clay o is the organic soil p it is the peat and w is the well graded p is the poorly graded m is the sealed graded whenever c would be there we call it it is used as an adjective we call it clay not clay for example if we have a soil sc we call it clay sand could you get my point and again the finer soil particularly the silt and clay they are not usually designated in terms of gradation rather they are actually uh, classified in terms of compressibility whether th those soil has high compressibility or low compressibility high compressibility is also known as high plasticity low compressibility is also known as low plasticity so whenever it is highly plastic that means we can deform that soil to any shape and that's why it is very very undesirable so what's the indication if the liquid limit is more than 50 we call it it is high plasticity if it is less than that we call it low plasticity so whenever a clay soil is there the liquid limit is more than uh, 50 we call it ch so that's how we actually classi classify the soil i believe you could all of you understand all these things and you could actually use the chart the chart is used to classify the soil for example we take a soil sample and in that if more than 50 percent say 100 percent sample we are taking so more than 50 percent of the sample if it is retained on number 200 say more than 50 percent re retaining on number 200 say that means if it is 52 percent retained and 48 percent per se whole 100 gram of the soil would be known as coarse grain soil but you get my point don't be confused coarser particle they are actually retaining on number number 200 so if more than 50 percent is retained then all the 100 gram of the soil would be known as coarse grain and if it is coarse grain we have two symbols over there one is gravel the other one is sand so these two to differentiate whether that particular soil is gravel and sand so we have to use some other criteria so once we get this gravel we call it we, the symbol is g and one it is say it, it is sand the symbol is s so depending on some other criteria uniformity coefficient and coefficient of uh, uh, curvature we could designate is say gw gp sw sorry sw sp or we could call it gm gc something like this we could have also also some dual classification so there is a criteria over there if only less than five percent of the soil is passing number 200 safe so whenever you have a, a, a laser time you just look into this chart i think you would understand that things but you have to always keep in mind that you, you have to use three criteria over there one if the less than five percent of the particle is passing through number 200 shape then the classification is only based on gradation that means well graded or poorly graded so depending on that we have four types of soil gw gp sw and sp if sign particles are, um, smaller particles are there we call it gm we call it gc we call it sm or we call it sc when it will happen whenever more than 12 percent of the sample would be passing number 200 say so similarly 
these are the uh, 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 classification and in this classification you could easily understand whenever you go through this chapter for the fine grain soil what we have to use we have to use a chart this is a bit simpler we call it actually plasticity chart you know plasticity chart plasticity chart is a chart of liquid limit and plasticity index for example you have you have you have some uh, more than 50% 50, 50 of the more of the soil is passing number 200 shape definitely this is fine grain soil so designation would be c or m would you get my point and that soil whether it has got high plasticity or low plasticity we could determine it from this plasticity chart this is a chart of last liquid limit versus plasticity index and we have a line over here whose equation is plasticity index is equal to 0.73 liquid limit minus 20 this is the line so what we used to do we determine this liquid limit and plastic limit for example you have determined this liquid limit liquid limit is say 40 and your plasticity index is 20 so it is lying lying over there this is the point so if it lies over this line we call it clay soil if it is below that we call it silty soil could you get my point so that's how we we we, we classify this uh, what is called the unified soil classification system we classify the soil now we move to esto soil, uh, soil classification system in esto soil classification system this is usually not used by the uh, what is called whenever we do uh, construction of building but still as you are civil engineer i am giving some hints over there in esto soil classification system the soil is classified into eight groups and they are given a number a1 to a8 a1 to A7 is the inorganic soil. A what? A1 is inorganic organic soil. Would you get my point? So depending on A number, the better would be the soil of the the as a subgrade material. Whenever the A number is less, for example, A1 is the best type of inorganic soil. A7 is the worst type of inorganic soil. And A8 definitely this is a bad type of soil. This is actually organic soil. So how would you determine whether that particular soil is inorganic or organic or inorganic? First of all, you have to look into the color. In both the cases, both in unified and astro soil classification system, you have to look into the color. If the soil is black in color, you have to always, you, you must be suspicious that that soil could be organic soil. Then you, you, you smell the odor, you, you, you have to smell it. If you find a very bad smell, then definitely it is organic soil. Then you have to go for two tests, you know, two, two tests, two liquid limit tests. I show you over here. So two liquid limit tests you have to do. Two liquid limit test means you soil, collect the soil sample from field. We dry it. One portion of the soil sample, we dry it in oven. oven. The other portion, you dry it in air. Could you get my point? So if you determine this liquid limit if the liquid limit of oven dry sample uh, divided by liquid limit of air dry sample is less than or equal to 0.75 definitely it is organic soil could you get my point for example you are you, you, you are getting a liquid limit of 30 for for uh, 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 oven dry sample and liquid limit 40 for air dry then 30 by 40 is equal to 0.75 so definitely it is organic soil to be confirmed the whether that soil is peat soil or not because the peat soil is the worst type of organic soil so you have to go for some other test which is known as loss on ignition test so from loss on ignition test you could be you, you could be confirmed that your soil is peat if, if from the loss ignition test if you get the ash content it is greater than 0.75 we call it actually peat soil so you will be getting this any in any textbook you will be getting these things only thing i'll ask you particularly if you practice as a geotechnical engineer you have to keep all these things in mind we shouldn't be actually what is called very casual in preparing this thing we have to know this soil particularly well and 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 then you have to decide about the type of the foundation so in esto soil classification system we use another index we call it group index could you get my point group index formula is this it's a formula like this so group, uh, 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 the lesser the value of group index 
the better is the soil for sub uh, subgrade construction so this is for highway engineers i am not actually get, getting into details so in in esto soil classification system you could also use a chart over there so if you use a chart you, you can actually get this classification it is like this now the as a geotechnical engineer you have to first identify the problematic soil then you could actually go for the design and all these things so among the problematic soil usually we have this highly compressible organic soil number two we could have a really liquefiable coarse grain soil as well it is coarse grain but it is liquefiable could you get my point during earthquake it really happens because of lot of shock and lot of vibration there could be tremendous development of pore water pressure in water and that could create some stresses so that the effective stress within the soil would be equal to zero and uh, then we call it actually liquefiable soil because its behavior would be something like liquid we have collapsible soil we have expansive soil we have highly sensitive quick clay we have dispersive soil we have dispersive soil in a form we call it erodible soil when it will disperse with velocity of water we call it actually erodible otherwise we call it dispersive we could have corrosive soil we could have high sulfate soil we could have also some other special types of soil for example sanitary landfill so for each type of soil we have actually some what is called this uh, test you have to do certain test from the test you could identify whether that soil is problematic or not once you de uh, determine that the soil is problematic either you have to take care by performing certain measure that means you have to give some medicine you know if you see a a people is a patient definitely you have to give some medicine so these are actually patients so you have to give some medicine over there otherwise if it is inorganic soil then you have to go for construction and sorry you have to go for design and definitely the design will depend on so many things you see we have discussed about soil mechanics but we have some complexities of soil mechanics you see it is this mechanics but it is not the solid mechanics is the soil mechanics which is particulate in nature soil is particulate in nature particles are there so load are being taken not by a single person it is taken by all others all lot of person whenever it is the duty of oh, so many things always it creates problem if i ask you to do a particular job you will definitely do it very quickly if i ask to do this job say for 10 percent definitely it will not be done as quickly as we expect so as such soil has got some complexities in using the normal actually mechanics so what are the complexities let's see it any civil engineering structure must rest on or within the ground generating stresses within the soil mass due to both external loading whenever it is external loading we call it external stresses it could have also stresses because of its own weight we call it overburden stresses this is one of the peculiarities in other material it could actually not it is a bit unusual whenever we design any foundation two basic things or principles are to be considered simultaneously number one this foundation shouldn't fail because of excessive shear and there shouldn't be any excessive settlement you see we have used this word shear we are not interested in any other stress in solid you have flexural stress you have tensile stress you have compressive stress you have a torsional stress so many stresses are there but over here we are only saying that we are concerned about shear stress why let's see and we, we we don't have any excessive settlement that means we don't have we shouldn't have actually excessive uh, what is called this uh, uh, it is a deformation now the another another thing is that a soil must consist of various sizes shapes and types of uh, types or origin of soil particles there exist void spaces within the soil mass and that void spaces can be occupied by water or can be occupied by air or can be occupied by both so when the external loading is applied the load would be shared by all these three phases initially load would be taken by all 
but as you know the the the, the, the most lighter one is air so air will escape first then water will escape and the soil doesn't have doesn't have any any what is called clue if the soil has to stay over there as a result of that the all the stresses eventually would be taken by the soil skeleton could you get my point that's why we have actually three or four types of stresses coming into being which is the total stress effective stress or contract stress effective stress is not exactly the same as contract stress we could have neutral stress also known as pore water pressure the pressure which is taken by the water and as such whenever a soil is coming in contact with water particularly if it is under water table it will create a lot of problem within the soil mass could you get my point a soil as we say the soil is our life but in case of soil it is not the life it is the death soil create sorry it's not soil water water is our life but in in case of soil water is not the life it is the cause of death so we must be very very careful about that whenever we are dealing with water particularly if a soil is taken from under water so i will give you a very small what is called this uh, 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 concept about this new, uh, effective stress we are sometimes a bit confused for example we are considering a a, a soil a soil uh, a plane excess plane say at a depth of z so obviously it will have a vertical pressure over there say a vertical pressure or load p is acting over there so this p would be shared by soil particle one particle is over there another particle is over there one particle is over there another particle is over there so there would be stresses over there we call it contract, contract stress so p1 divided by this area we call it actually contract stress for part, particle type 1 that means the particle will be it, each other will be contracted this is the top particle this is the bottom one this is p2 this is p3 this is p4 this is p5 also this in between water they will also take this load in case of soil the plane i did assume plane is like this but with this with this load you cannot actually break this particle rather what will happen the particles will slide past one another so there would be a plane on that particular plane it will share for what reason it will share i will tell you the story later okay a bit later so but this is a bit wavy shape the amplitude this is very very small particles are over there soil particles are not very big 4.75 with the size of the particle which is uh, uh, actually uh, sand so over here this even if it is wavy wavy surface for all practical reasons we assume that this is a plane could you uh, could you could you could you get my point this is a plane this, this is the this is the assumed plane but this is the idealized plane so whenever we are considering p1 p2 p3 p4 we will be getting stresses over there this area measurement of this area is so difficult you see the area over here is very small so contrast stress would be very very high over there contrast stress would be less over there contrast stress could be medium over there small over there we cannot actually what is called determine all these contrast stresses so that it would be used in mechanics rather what we used to do so we 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 do some simple mathematics like this p1 p2 p3 p4 this one plus u into aw aw does mean the area covered by the water this is the area covered by the particle a1 a2 a3 a4 a5 if you compare the total area comparing the total area this area is very very small could you get my point but water has a lot of area this is area this is area this is area so this area is aw and this one a1 a2 a3 a4 and a5 so all this area whenever we add it up we get the total area which is a so let's go for this simple uh, mathematics sorry it is it okay okay so p1 plus p2 plus p3 plus p4 p5 and and u into a aw u is the pore water pressure so if the pressure is multiplied by area we call it force so this all these forces would be equivalent to p could you get my point so if the stress over here is sigma and the area is a1 we call it sigma 1 a1 
सिग्मा टू ए टू सिग्मा थ्री ए थ्री सिग्मा फोर ए फोर सिग्मा फाइव ए फाइव प्लस यू इन टू ए डब्ल्यू शुड बी इक्वल टू पी इन टू ए बिकॉज पी सॉरी इफ इफ दोटल स्ट्रेस इफ यू कंसिडर सिग्मा then p by a we call it actually total stress whole area we load is divided by the whole area so if we simplify it you see you can simplify it what, what is the magnitude of a so <laughs> magnitude of sigma so if we have to i we have to divide it all by a so we are dividing all by a over here u into a w by a this is this is a I, I think it is a very small calculation. You could easily understand this one. So over here, we can write it like this. This is this is like this. It's okay. U into A W means total area minus A C. A C means it is the contract area of soil particle. Do you get my point? So over here, we will be getting this plus it is U. This is actually U into A C by eight A. AC by A, A, AC is so small, we can say this one almost equal to zero. And that's why neglecting this one, we can get this. And this is known as sigma is equal to, this we call it sigma prime, and this we call it pore order pressure. That's why we have a very important formula over there, that effective stress is equal to total stress minus pore order pressure. Could you get my point? Effective stress, I am interested in that. Reason is that all the shear strength and all the compressibility they are actually uh, they are the functions of effective stress, not the total stress. So what the soil skeleton is taken, it is the important. Could you get my point? You are applying a load, water is escaping. So what's the use of water? It is always creating a problem. So only thing is that it is a time dependent procedure. As the voids are very fine voids water will take time to escape out and with time de definitely eventually it will escape out that means with time effective stress will increase and pore water pressure will decrease and finally at a particular time pore water pressure would be zero and all the loads would be taken by a soil skeleton and in that particular case effective stress is equal to total stress i have a small, small calculation over there for example you have to calculate out this effective stress over here. What is the effective stress? You see water table is over there. Say it is one meter. This is actually three meter thickness of a soil layer. And this is another four meter thickness of soil layer. I ask you, so uh, uh, we require to calculate out the effective stress over there. So what to do? For example, you consider this level and above this, this sort of material is over there. All soil and water is there. So if you consider all the weights, that could represent the effective stress, total stress. So total stress would be equal to 1 meter into 9.81, gamma W into H. So 1 meter into 9.81, it is the unit weight of water. Then 3 meter into 16, this is the uh, unit weight of what is called this soil, uh, soil. And this is 4 into 18. So 4 into 18, 129.8. This is, we call it total stress. 129.8. Pore water pressure, it depends on the water column. From here, the water column height is how much? 1 meter, 3 meter, and 4 meter. So it is 8 meter into 9.81. So it is 78.5. So effective stress is how much? 129.8 minus 78.5, so 51.3. Could you get my point? So this stress is responsible, not this stress. This stress is responsible for the deformation and for all what is called this. There is another alternative method. We could also calculate it in that way. So you should only consider total stress and effective stress is always occurring in soil, not in water. So if you disregard this, sorry, then you could use the alternative alternative calculation procedure. But as soon as I, I, I am concerned, I, I consider this one a bit easier. So that's how you could actually calculate. I, I think uh, you don't have any confusion because we are calculating it like what is the reason? Because we, we cannot determine this contract stress. Could you get my point? If we could know, if we could measure the contract stresses on individual particles, definitely in that case, we could do that. But we have a formula that total stress is equal to 
uh, effective stress per pore water pressure and that's why we are determining pore water pressure we could determine it easily and we subtract it from total stress and we are getting the effective stress now the fourth complexity is third we have already mentioned and fourth complexity is whatever may be the external loading this is the most important one the eventual failure within the soil mass would occur because of slippage or shear on a particular surface whatever may be the load it could be compression it could be tension it could be moment let me share a what is called the diagram what really happens in nature so if it is a footing it is a, some load is applied over there whenever you load a footing the soil immediately beneath the footing in say in such a pressure of triangular area it would be so compacted as if it would be acting as an integral part of footing so that's why if you apply further load it would be moving like ways would you get my point it would be moving like this whenever it is trying to infiltrate into the into the what is called soil mass the neighboring soil will never spare they will not allow you to enter you cannot actually allow some other people to enter your own house and that's why when it would be trying to move in that direction it cannot move in that direction so it will try to move in that direction it cannot also move in that direction because there are already soil in that direction it cannot move in that direction as well so only option is that soil could move in the upward direction because one it reaches over there it could stress the it could release the stress nobody wants to take any stresses everybody or everything wants to release the stresses could you get my point so what is happening the soil particle will have a tendency to move in the out, upward direction and also it will have a tendency to move in the upward direction so if two forces are like this it will always follow the diagonal so you see we are applying actually compressive load but this one is moving in the diagonal direction so it will sleep, sleep on that particular surface so it, it, the fashion of this of, of this sliding would be different so we have various theories about that but usually what happens whenever you are loading like this always failure would be failure surface would be like this even if you apply the lateral load you just try to imagine you are applying horizontal load definitely it will move in that direction it will sleep on that particular surface and that's why shear strength is so important we are not actually concerned about any other stresses because the soil is a granular material and from from the from the from this important concept the people have developed this formula that ultimate bearing capacity bearing capacity means it is the stresses acting over here ultimate bearing capacity would be c n c plus half b gamma n gamma plus q n q this is the popular bearing capacity formula among you perhaps know this these three n c n gamma and n q the we call it bearing capacity factors and the the, the pro property or the friction of the soil is responsible for that or angle of internal friction of the soil is responsible for that i'll tell you the story of angle of internal friction and cohesion a bit later so this is uh, i think we could easily understand that the, the 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 whatever may be the external loading the eventual failure within the soil must be occurring because of slippage on a particular surface could you get my point the other point as soil is a particular material whatever whenever there is any vertical stress we are applying any vertical stress it could be also from the soil whenever there is any vertic vertical uh, load the soil will have a tendency to expand in the lateral direction could you get my point so whenever we, we load the soil it will try to expand in the lateral direction but the neighboring soil will give lateral pressure because you, you cannot display some other people could you get my point you cannot actually display some other soil so they will also try to react so in case of soil what happens whenever there is any vertical load there must be induced lateral stresses you don't have to give any stress laterally automatically there would be some induced uh, lateral stresses over there so these lateral stresses are normally known as active pressure passive pressure and uh, earth pressure at rest and and, and coefficient is k0 kp and uh, ka so i move a bit fast so so in case of shear strength 
the, as shear strength is very very important the shear strength can be represented like this if a soil fails due to shear on a particular uh, particular surface then on that particular surface there could be two types of stresses on any surface you, you have actually two types of stresses one is perpendicular to the plane we call it normal stress another one is parallel to the plane we call it shear stress so that shear stress or strength in soil can be represented by a straight line which is tau is equal to c plus sigma tan phi so over here sigma is the normal stress tau is the shear c and phi we call it shear strength parameters do you get my point so about shear we we have another one another display over there for example so it is it is, it is actually vertical stress this is shear so if it is shear that must be equal to c plus sigma b into 10 phi if it is it is a plane it is occurring or that here so over here the normal stress is vertical if a soil face like this in the vertical plane then the horizontal stress would be acting as normal stress and vertical stress would be acting as a shear could you get my point so over here in that particular plane this is normal stress this would be parallel so this would be acting as a shear stress so the next one we have shear strength of a soil is dependent on drainage condition thus involving drained and undrained strength so drained and understand means whether the water would be there or whether water, water would be expelled out so if it water is there remains and and no drainage of water we call it actually drain condition and otherwise it is undrained condition so whenever we apply fast load then it is undrained if we construct very slow low slow then it is actually drained depending shear strength is also parameters sorry shear strength parameter also depend on the depositional history. Depositional history, the another story is over there. Prabuddha. Dr. Prabuddha, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you extend my time a bit? Can I lecture up to 10? Um, your normal time is what? From 8.30 to... 10 oh, or oh, sorry sorry it is up, up to 10 eh? it is up to 10 i think if it is up to 10 it should be okay no but no 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 I, no i'm sorry I, I mixed it up so you you started at 7 30 so oh yeah yes i i started at 7 30 so, so yeah, i go yeah yeah it, it, i will have lecture up to 10 yes then i will actually question and answer yeah that 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 should be all right yes okay 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 so depending on depositional history for example you are considering a soil at any particular plane, say at a depth of h, obviously that will they will have a stress. Would you get my point? Usually the unit weight of the soil is around uh, it is 15 to say 20. For example, you have a unit weight of soil is 18. If it is at a depth of 5 meter, then you have a normal stress of 5 into 18, 90 kilo newton per meter square. Would you get my point? If a soil, if a soil, if the plane in any 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 position if a soil the existing overburden pressure is the highest in its life then we call it normally consolidated soil previously if it has got some other loads that means the present pressure is not the maximum pressure we call it actually over consolidated soil so the shear strength parameter c and phi will also depend on the normally consolidated and over consolidated another point is that the settlement is a time dependent procedure would you get my point the last the next point is soil is heterogeneous in nature both vertically and specially so this will also create pro problem and degree of saturation is another important thing so degree of uh, 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 saturation is so important so you see all the complexities are coming to the soil and whenever you will be dealing with the shear strength of soil it is really complex matter I will give a very small example because it will help you to understand about the soil strength parameters. For example, you have a river bed deposition. In the first year, you have a soil deposit over there. It is the layer one. It is depositing over there. At that time, it was a slurry. So if it is slurry, no weight is over there. No effective load is over there. 
because no soil is above it. So no effective stress, no normal stress, the shear stress is zero. So if we want to draw this condition over there, then if we draw it in sigma tau plane, so this would be equal to zero. Sigma is equal to zero, tau is also zero. In the second year, some soil is depositing over there. Could you get my point? So then this would be acting as a load on that per first year. So as a result of that, it will try to, the, some of the water from uh, layer one would be expelled out and it will gain certain stiffness. So as a result of that, the shear, it, it will have a normal stress and it will also have shear stress. So the second point, we draw it here. Third point is similar. Fourth point is similar. We draw four points over there. <laughs> so if we if shear and normal is there, we know that the it, it, it has a relationship which is equal to C plus sigma tan phi. So if C phi sigma tan phi is a straight line. So if we fit it like this, it will always pass through the origin. This sort of soil, you see, these are all normally consolidated because this is the maximum load in his life. No load is over there. This is the maximum in his life at that particular position. This, this was the maximum. This was the maximum. So these are all normally consolidated soil. So whatever may be the type of the soil, you will never get a C for normally consolidated soil. Even if it is clay, you will never get C. We will always get phi. Could you get my point? That's why it is so important for us. And if it is over consolidated, for example, this one is eroded for some reasons. All the two, three, four layers is eroded. It is eroded. So the soil layer one is staying over there. If it is staying over there, condition is such. What is happening? Now there is no load over there. No overburden stays over there. So it is not the maximum in its life. So this is actually over consolidated. Could you get my point? At this particular point, the soil doesn't have any normal load. But still, it will have some stiffness. And that's why if we want to draw this point over there, we'll be getting this point. This one, again, it is depositing. In that particular case, also, this is not the maximum. But it will have definitely a bit higher shear stand. More is the normal load, more is the uh, shear stand. So we, we, we draw the second point over there. So this is also not the maximum. So this is also over consolidated. Third year. This is also not the maximum. So we got the point over there. Fourth year, it is just equal. Now it is normally consolidated because this is the, what is called this maximum load in its life. So we are getting this point. So if you connect this, all four, then what will happen? This will actually, will have a straight line like this. You are getting some intercept over there. That one is known as C and this angle is known as phi. Could you get my point? But what will happen if more load is applied over there? Then this is the maximum load in his history. So this is actually normally consolidated again. Could you get my point? So if the in that case, if you measure the shear and normal force, then we'll be getting this point. And if you connect these two, this is normally consolidated, this is normally consolidated, definitely it will pass through the origin. So the same soil, Sometimes it could be normally consolidated, sometimes it could be over consolidated. But what happens, you see, this is very, very important. You must always keep in your mind that whenever we are going for testing any soil, we have to depend on the effective overburden pressure. For example, you are taking a soil sample from the field. It has got a, uh, uh, say, uh, overburden pressure of 20. So, Whenever you are going for triaxial test and direct test, you have to give some normal load of, or cell pressure. So what should be that normal load? <coughs> Whenever you are taking the soil sample out from the borehole, the soil is already over consolidated. Could you get my point? So now, if you is the normal load less than the overburden pressure, the soil is over consolidated. For example, you are using cell, three cell pressure which is less than 120, then definitely you will be getting this line. You will be getting C and phi. But if you use all the normal loads higher than 120, you will be getting this line and you will never get C. Could you get my point? So this is very, very important. <clears throat> now, 
I think now it is a serious matter. I moved to the provision uh, in BNBC about these things. <laughs> so first one, division one, it is the side investigation, soil classification, material and foundation type. Sorry for that. I have mentioned all the items over there because at least we will know what are the things included in what is called this our PNBC 2020. So the first section is general. This is quite uh, a, a quite a simple thing. And the second one is scope. We have already discussed it. The, in, in engineering, it's your technical engineering. You must have a lot of engineering judgment. And then definition and symbol, you see. In this definition, a lot of useful things are there. I think if you read these things, you could actually uh, meet all uh, uh, your confusion, uh, confusion, particularly about the bearing uh, capacity terms. For example, we have the we have the term bearing capacity. We have the term allowable bearing capacity. We have the term allowable load. We have the term gross bearing capacity. We have the term net pressure. We have the safe bearing capacity. We have the net safe bearing capacity, we have the presumptive bearing capacity, safe settlement pressure, ultimate bearing capacity or gross ultimate bearing capacity. This is very, very important. Ultimate bearing capacity, it is the capacity which is determined from analytical methods because you are getting this <coughs> formula, sorry, sorry for this. You are getting this formula, Q ultimate is equal to CNC plus a B gamma N gamma and Q N Q. So these are quite straightforward. You will be getting this over there. The next one is side investigations. Sorry for the mistake. It is a spelling mistake over there. Side investigation uh, in 3.41.1 subsurface survey. That means in this survey, you will be doing how to do this uh, uh, underlying all other uh, utility facilities. For example, it could be some uh, Suarez drain or some cable line this one from subsurface survey. But subsoil investigation, especially it will investigate the soil, soil underneath, because all the uh, load would be resting over there. So we didn't have actually detailed method of exploration. We have several types of uh, exploration, means several types of boring. So this is actually described in uh, some appendices. So uh, this is again quite straightforward. I think you'd understand this thing. Number of location and investigating uh, investigation point. This one also mentioned in the code, you could get it from there. Depth of exploration, it is, I have partially omitted this one because uh, someone actually uh, raised me this question that one thing of, written over there, a rule of thumb used for this purpose is to extend the boring to a depth where the additional load resulting from the proposed building is less than 10% of the average load average load of the structure or less than 5% of the effective stress of soil at that depth. It is a bit difficult to understand this thing. So I, I, I elaborate this thing. So I elaborate it like this. A commonly used rule is that unless bedrock is encountered, boring should be carried out to such a depth that the net increase in soil stress caused by the proposed construction is less than 10% of the maximum below. Do you get my point? And number two, which is second technique employs the concept of drilling to depth, where the net increase in soil stress caused by the proposed construction is limited to, le uh, le limited to less than 5% of the effective stress caused by the weight of the soil. I will give you an example to elaborate the things. Before that, I, I have missed something in, in what is called this previous one. Uh, over there. So what you will do whenever you, you are going for for uh, for uh, testing, which norm, uh, normal load you are going to use? Yes, we don't know how much load would be coming from the building. If we knew that the this sort of load is coming from the building exactly, or how many floors would be there? Initially, we could design about this what is called this uh, seven uh, four. Then it could go up to ten four. So we really don't know exactly. And we are doing this before the design of the building. And that's why what we used to do. One of the normal load, usually to determine the shear strength, we, we use three normal loads and or three, three cell pressure. One of the normal loads should be very close to effective overburden pressure. For example, if the effective overburden pressure is 120, you keep it 120. 
the other one is 50 percent of this you make another one 60 the other one is double of this you make it 240 could you get my point so that's how we will be getting average things like this so some people actually ask me sir you, you you did test and you are getting the cn5 from there but some other people tested they didn't get cn5 what's the reason because the common notion is that whenever it is cohesive or clay soil you will be getting c no it is not that c that c is for bonding this is actually some other parameter it shouldn't have actually named c cohesion it, uh, it, it, it is not the appropriate term you know it should have been the other name over here this is different c this is the parameter c so the parameter c will depend whether your particular soil is normally consolidated or over consolidated so over here i'll be getting for an example what does it mean actually oh sorry sorry for this for example it is like this this one is written quantity criteria one the increase in vertical stress divided by this q this should be equal to 0.1 or increase in stress divided by the stress caused by soil overburden pressure if the uh, overburden effective pressure diagram is something like this then you consider a point like this which is del sigma z by del 0 is equal to 0 0.05 i give the numerical example you will understand i think clearly the first one over there eh? the effective it, it is the case of 10 percent over here the load is 1800 kilo newton so this footing is 3 by 3 the stress is it is this is this but increase in stress is how much already the stress was there for 1.5 meter of soil so we subtract this one increase in stress is 176 kph so considering 2 is to 1 vertical stress distribution usually we have a lot of distribution formula we have bosina's theory we have most uh, uh, newton uh, new mass chart we have a lot of theories there but commonly what we used to do we use a 2 is to 1 ratio in distributing the soil uh, uh, because this footing is distributing the soil over there this is the distribution stresses soil over there but soil will always try to propagate the stresses it will transfer the stresses like this so if it is 2 is to 1 at a depth if we consider a depth of say z0 then it means z0 by 2 is over there z0 by 2 over there and in that case if we consider both the direction the area of the of the stress distribution would be 3 plus z0 but you get my point so the total stress over here is how much 176 into 9 this is actually 9 means 176 is the stress over there area is 9 so this is the load over there and area is 3 plus z0 3 plus z0 so that should be equal to 10 percent of this load could you get my point so from there we'll be getting this one as this one so we get a z0 value of 65 that means this one is saying that you are you will have to do a boring of 6.5 meter the other one is about five percent you see the effective particle pressure at z0 this is the different z0 not the same one so effective particle stress at z0 should be equal to how much you see this is a soil layer over there over here there is a pressure 40 because this is actually 1.5 and this is actually one meter so all the soil will have a unit weight of 16 so 16 into 2.5 this is 40 so 40 stress is over there then it is increasing so 40 this is actually saturated soil it is under water table so effective stress is equal to total unit weight is how much 18 this is actually unit weight 18 so 18 minus 9.81 into z0 so that will give this and this five percent of this five percent of this is this much this should be equal to how much the stress is coming over there how much stress is coming is the same 176 into 9 divided by this so the equation would be ultimately like this so this should be a trial and error method if you uh, use this one you will be getting a depth of 7.5 meter could you get my point you just look into look into the uh, uh, notes you will get it so you can go for 7.5 meter of this 
some people says the minimum of this tip the, this two some people says it should be maximum of, of this two so we are re, uh, we are recommending your judgment you are recommending your judgment could you get my point so that one i i i finished over there sounding and uh, and penetration test also it is included in uh, this is c 3.4.6 I have to uh, discuss few, uh, few points over there, particularly regarding the SPT correction. So you have to always keep in mind the facts regarding SPT correction. It was only late, as late as 1957, Gibbs and Halls, two renowned geotechnical engineers, suggested that correction should be made for field SPT value for, for a depth. As the correction factor came to be considered only after 1957, all the empirical data published before 97, like those of Tarjagi, is for uncorrected value of SPT. So be careful. Whenever you are using this formula, you should always keep in mind that whether this formula is came into being before 1957 or after 1957. Then, uh, about this, uh, since then, a number of investigators have suggested overburden correction. So overburden correction is how much? Gibbs and Hulls suggested a standard of 280 kilonewton per meter square, corresponding of depth of 14. Then another person, they suggested, a, a, a particularly this uh, Thornburn suggested 138 corresponding to 7 meter. Finally, in 1974, Peck, Hansen and Thornburn, we have an, uh, published a book, it is found on Foundation Engineering, just suggested a standard value of 100 kilonewton per meter square. That means whenever we perform the SPT test, it could be from different depths. They are saying that whenever we are getting the SPT value at an effective overburden pressure of 100 kilonewton per meter square, then this is the standard one. And otherwise, you have to actually go for this correction. So the correction. Uh, that's uh, that's what about this correction you will get actually a lot of what is called this term about uh, about this n values a eh? lot of things in in the literature lot of designations for example in bnbc only this uh, uh, red mark are ignored in bnbc bnbc we have this green colors we have in, in not this one this one also neglected so in 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 in, in other place i will show you which are adapted by bnbc so we could get the terms like SPD value, N value, SPT N value, N SPT, S field, N, NF, all for re, raw field data. We could get N1, field value, field value is collected only for overburden, considering one TSF load, only for overburden, nothing else. This is N1. This is also not we use now. NC or N prime. Some people suggested that particularly the uh, people at the earlier stage, they suggested that whenever we are doing SPT and if it is done on silt and fine sand and if it is under water table and the water table is, uh, sorry, SPT value is greater than 50, then you have to go for a correction, which is water table correction. We don't use this correction now. So you know already that this is designated as NC and N prime. The formula is N prime is equal to 15 plus n minus 15 divided by 2. Could you get my point? So we have another one, n60. It is corrected for uh, SPT value for hammer efficiency only, nothing else. And they consider the hammer efficiency as 60%. That means the energy of the hammer should be, theoretically, hammer weight is on 40 pound, and it is dropped from a height of 2.5 feet. So energy should be 140 into 2.5. This is the 100% energy. But in most of the cases in the field, you are getting an, uh, the hammer. It actually, uh, because of different uh, phenomena, we are not getting 100% of the efficiency of the hammer. Do you get my point? That's why 60% they are considering a standard. Some people are considering 70% a standard, uh, particularly in Canada and you know, all people. We have new N60, but it is corrected for Hammer efficiency and all other field procedure. For example, drill length, for example, this borehole diameter, for example, the characteristics sampler, all this. 
and then again we could have some other values n160 written like this or n160 written like this this is corrected spt value with both corrections of all field procedure and overburden and this is only valid for sandy soil this is only valid for sandy soil this one is valid for all types of soil would you get my point so all this though in in bnbc also we are we have mentioned this one but we, we are not we, we didn't actually encourage to use this one particularly whenever you will be using this tazegis formula then maybe you have to correct this one by that means you are getting this value and then also you correct it for this formula it is it is also already mentioned in in what is called this uh in 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 our appendices okay so spt value we are report, recommending at this but this one uh, uh, this should, should be used for the formula uh, coming before what is called this uh, uh, 1957 okay okay so these corrections are over there or uh, n60 it is uh, coming like this so n60 is equal to as 60 percent efficiency the standard so we always compare it with 60 percent mr efficiency so this is this should be done for all types of soil and bnbc recommends the use of correction factor with n60 so that we will be getting n160 which is usually used which is usually used for liquefaction analysis. These days, some other some other people are also using for all other type of soil, but usually it is for liquefaction analysis. You see, the formula is over there. You will get it very uh, easily whenever you go through it. This is the dilatancy correction, as I told you before. Huh? So now we, we move to uh, what is called this geotechnical investigation as a report. Uh, in subsurface investigation, whenever you are preparing the geotechnical engineering report, I have noticed many people, they are doing the geotechnical investigation. In addition to that, they are also doing some job of foundation engineer. They are actually investigating the soil. They shouldn't actually do any recommendation. They shouldn't design any foundation. You see? Some people do the pathological test, but usually doctors, he prescribes the medicine. Could you get my point? So even if you are competent, you should actually produce two reports over there. One for subsoil investigation, the other one is for foundation design. But because this is confusing, if you, if you recommend certain skin fiction and end bearing over here in a report, the contractor might use that one. That they are not supposed to. The contractor is always supposed to do his independent soil investigation. And this, this creates actually a lot of problems, particularly if it is a overseas contractor like this, then you have to go for uh, some sort of arbitration or something like this, because always there are confusion. So the BNBC is not mentioning about this geotechnical bearing capacity and all these things. We are BNBC recommending that you should actually only limit it to your investigation, not to the foundation design. So uh, in section 3.5, this is actually identification of soil it is quite sta straightforward. I told you before, but if you go for field identification test, you have to go some field identification test, you know, you have to take dry strength, plasticity, all these things, quite straightforward, you'll get it from here. Particle size classification, we have already done it. Engineering classification, we have already done it. Identification of um, identification of organic soil, we have already done it. We have to determine it. It is also suggested in, in BNBC. Then identification and classification of expansive soil. So you have to do some test, which is shrinkage limit and linear shrinkage and swelling test and some other test. From there, you could actually get it. Similarly, for collapsible soil, we have certain tests. Dispersive soil, we have certain tests. And soft inorganic soil, we have certain tests. These are straightforward. In section 3.6, we have materials. I don't want to discuss it over there. This is something like concrete, steel, um, uh, uh, sorry, steel and timber. It is uh, printed twice. Don't worry. And in uh, section 3.7, we have actually types of foundation. 
that means shallow foundation footing wrap deep foundation driven pile boat pile it is a drill pier cation etc etc so i think it is it is there you could easily understand from, from there in 3.8 we have shallow foundation that is distribution of bearing pressure how bearing pressure is distributed dimension of the footing how to determine this dimension thickness of the footing footing in field soil whenever it will in field soil what you are going to do soil and rock property selection minimum depth of foundations cover then mass movement of ground or in unstable areas foundation excavation deep uh, de design consideration for rough foundation you see for the time constant it is a big big subject and that's why it is not possible i believe if whenever you will go through the code and whenever you will go through a standard book uh, i think you will get it through there shouldn't be any problem in section 3.9 it is geotechnical design of shallow foundation so it is it is important for us <coughs> it is uh, one is general then the design load bearing capacity of shallow foundation settlement structural design settlement of shallow foundation this thing so i have omitted this one geotechnical design of a deep foundation <coughs> driven precast pile it is a definition then application where we use it material penetration estimated pile length type of driven pile better pile selection of soil pile driven equipment design capacity all are over there i don't want to discuss it over here because of this time constraint so next one section 10 i will be concentrating on uh, on this a bit so it is the geotechnical design of deep foundation it is 3.10.10 ultimate geotechnical capacity of driven precast pile for axial load whenever we will be using compressive load then how we could actually determine analytically the geotechnical capacity of that particular pile could, could you get my it, it, get my point it is the pile foundation so the ultimate load carrying capacity if it is q ultimate of a pile consists of two parts one is due to the friction called skin friction the other one is called uh, uh, shape resistance uh, uh, sorry it is uh, it is a skin friction qs the other one is uh, coming from the base resistance, which will, we call it QB. It is the end bearing or base resistance. This is coming from the circumferential area, which call it skinny fixture. So Q ultimate should be equal to, if in terms of load, it is the capacity Q ultimate over there, but it must be capital Q over there. Q ultimate, it is the load. So it should be equal to QS plus QB. Huh? So we write this equation like this. Unfortunately, at that time, initially, the weight of the pile is included over here. So this is actually formula 3.6.11. What really happens is that you are actually driving this one into a soil. And instead of soil, you are inserting certain concrete. So the unit weight of soil and concrete is not that, is not that big. So in determining this thing, I would suggest, or in the next volume, maybe it will be coming, that you should actually disregard this weight over here. Would you get my point? For ultimate capacity is OK. Allowable working capacity is equal to Q ultimate divided by factor of safety. And factor of safety is another point over there. So in a, a, where a W is the weight of the pile and factor of safety of gas, so we have a comment over there. To be consistent with the pile load test result, because in pile load test, uh, what we are doing, we are actually applying load on the pile uh, head and determining the capacity. We are not actually uh, considering the weight over there. So to be consistent with the pile load uh, results and the effect of overburden, it is not reasonable. It is reasonable, sorry. It is reasonable to ignore weight of pile W from both the equation 6.3.11 and load calculation, which is the current practice. So I think uh, we, we will not use this value used over there. Sorry. So over here, the, the, the ultimate other methods are also there. We, I am not actually discussing because of constraint of time, use of static bearing capacity by the use of space PT and CPT, by load test and by dynamic uh, loads. So this is actually uh, about factor of safety. 
So this is interesting that the factor of safety is not now very straightforward. So now we have a lot of factors over there. That means we could have actually good control, we could have normal control, we, we could have poor control, very poor control. And depending on that, whether the structure is monumental, whether the structure is permanent or temporary, usually we do, do that one, permanent structure, that means design life is between 25 to 100. In that case, what we used to do, if it is go good quality, we use a factor of safety of two. In other cases, maybe it is 2.5, 2.8, and 2.3. So now we are defining this good control, normal control, and this control. So good control, what we see is like this. So proper soil investigation, if it is done, proper review of subsoil report, if it is done, supervision by compact, uh, competent geotechnical and foundation engineer, if it is done, load test data, if it is done, qualified contractor, if it is there, proper construction equipment there, maintaining proper construction log, then we have a good control. So some other control is defined over there. Could you get my point? So from here, you could decide about the factor of safety. But normally in pile foundation, what we used to do, it is already written in the in the in the in the board pile that whenever we perform load test, we keep a factor of safety of two. Otherwise, it could be 2.5 or 3. So whenever QS, QS is like this, QS is equal to is the total load from the surface, it is equal to AS into FS. So if it is AS into FS and QB, sorry, sorry, there is a mistake over there. It is QB is equal to AB into FB. Sorry for that. It is not QS. QB is equal to AB into FB. So, S is equal to a unit thin friction. FS is equal to, sorry, AS is equal to area, friction area. Uh, FS is equal to skin friction, unit skin friction. AB is the end bearing area and FB is equal to this. So, FB when we will be considering we will be considering the property of the soil from the tip of the pile to a depth of two times of B. So we have to consider the properties over there. Eh? So if it is a stratified soil, then skin friction would be for each layer we have to determine the skin friction and we have to add it up. Then determining skin friction will depend on the basically on the type of the soil. If it is cohesive soil and we if we have cohesionless soil, so we could have actually different methods. In 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 cohesive soil, we could have three methods. In 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 BNBC, we are recommending two methods. One is alpha method. The other one is beta method. Whenever the soil will have only C, that means you are determining the shear strength parameter. How it is happening? Let's see. So how it is actually happening? You are actually applying pressure like this. So as a result of that, it would be resisting like this. Also resistant would be coming from the bottom. And over here, what is happening? There is a vertical stress. Because of the vertical stress, there would be induced lateral stresses. So because of this, there would be shear acting over there. This is the skin friction. So if we have only cohesive soil, it does mean cohesive soil has the equation like this, tau is equal to Cu. And then, because of this driving or because of this boring, we have actually a lot of disturbance within the soil. And as a result of that, we will be using some factor over there. It is not exactly, uh, it, is, it is not exactly what is called this uh, CU. Because failure in occurring becomes concrete and soil, not between soil and soil. If it is between soil and soil, then it is okay, CU. Concrete and soil, we will be using some factor, we call it addition factor. So in BNBC, uh, it is recommended that the alpha value you will be considering this. Would you get my point? <laughs> so it is all written over there. I think there is a printing mistake in, in the BNBC is like this. <laughs> and it, it would be not skin fiction, it would be end bearing. So then we have beta method. Beta method means it is for coercion less soil. You see, we have two equations. About, uh, we have the equation tau is equal to C plus sigma tan phi. C, we call it coercion, and phi, we will call it friction, angle of internal friction. Whenever C is there, no phi, we call it cohesive, irrespective of any type of soil. And whenever C is not there, <coughs> and only friction is there, 
we call it quotientless. Would you get my point? So even if a soil is clay, whenever it is normally consolidated, you will be only getting phi. In that case, we will be using the other method, which is actually beta, beta method. So in beta method, what happens? Skin friction is coming from the lateral pressure. And as a result of that, beta method, if we write this equation, it is something like this. Tau is equal to this. So tau is equal to sigma tan phi. This is over here. This is sigma x. This is the normal load. This is the normal load. And tan, tan phi means it is the angle of internal friction over there. This tan phi, it is not the exactly tan phi. It should be failure between soil and pile. So instead of using <coughs> phi, we use delta below over there. And everything, if we consider delta and beta, uh, uh, we call it actually, uh, th this quantity, we call it actually beta. If you look into this node, there shouldn't be any problem. So we will be using this beta method over there. So this is the thing, how to calculate out the skin friction from beta method. Uh, you see, the end bearing is very interesting. Sorry, I, I did not actually show you the end bearing for cohesive soil. Okay, this is the end bearing uh, for cohesive soil. Cu, QB is equal to Cu at the base, NC into base, AB is the base. NC, we call it bearing capacity factor. But it is a different bearing capacity factor. It is not for shallow foundation. It is for deep foundation. Could you get my point? So if we know the Cu, the state will be using NC into AB. AB is the area, cross-sectional area. Usually for deep foundation, usually deep foundation, the NC value is 9. So QB will be getting it as 9. Straightforward, 9 into Cu. 9 into Cu. That means Cu is the value of Cu of the layer on which the pile is resting. Whole pile is passing through cohesionless soil, but it is resting on cohesive soil. Obviously, in that case, end bearing would be this. Could you get my point? So this is the thing. So we are getting QB from there. Now, it is the beta method. So in beta method, we have to use a value of beta. So beta uh, in, in, in BNBC, it is, these are, the, these are actually mentioned over here, but in simplified form, some form of beta is given there. Beta is, so I didn't actually mention it over here, but beta is given, I know. For some angle, beta is given, okay? So we can actually get beta from there. And important thing is that this is actually NQ. NQ is the bearing capacity factor. It is for pile. So we have given this chart. Huh? This is actually mentioned in BNBC that you have to, it, it, it depend on angle of internal friction. You do the test, you get a phi and you determine this NQ. About NQ, <laughs> it, it, is, it is something like our COVID vaccine, you know. <coughs> Sorry for this. <coughs> can I can I take a break just for one minute? Okay, I take a just break for one minute. That's fine, Professor Bean. Sorry for this. Sorry for this. No problem, okay. Professor Aberdeen. Okay. So I'll show you a chart. You could, uh, yeah, these are the thing. Beta value is given over there for diff uh, different angle. And also NQ values are given there for loose sand, for dense sand, and all these things. NQ is there. I'll show you an interesting what is called this thing huh? for the value of NQ. You see, this is a chart. It is published by Prakash and Shawma in Pile Foundation Engineering Practice. It is in page 222. You could actually consult this book. You see the value of value of NQ for different angle. Huh? If the angle is say 35 degree, Tarjagi is saying the value is 41. Whereas the <coughs> DBR is saying it is 380. Do you get my point, the variation? So some people actually complains, always complains about the bearing capacity. 
So in BNBC, we have recommended some moderate one. So we have recommended the Berenza safe one, but you see, you have to use engineering judgment. You, if you can justify, you can use also some other values. So don't worry it. So we have <coughs> used some moderate values. Then about the critical depth of end bearing and skin friction. Uh, it is believed that the skin friction would become constant at a certain depth, particularly whenever it is cohesionless soil. Indefinitely, the skin friction cannot actually increase. They says that, okay, after certain depth, the skin friction will never increase. Skin friction is a function of overburden pressure. So, overburden pressure will, will become constant. It is something like this. In BNBC, we have mentioned like this. This critical depth is 10 D for loose soil, 15 D for medium sand, and 20 D for dense sand. It does mean if you vertical stress, the formula is vertical stress sigma is equal to or sigma prime is equal to gamma w into h or gamma into h. Gamma is the unit weight of the soil. So if the unit weight of the soil is over here, say 16, this layer is 16. So if we want to draw a, a, a what is called this uh, this overburden pressure diagram, so over here it is 16 into 2. Unit weight is 16, this is 2 to 36. And now it is sandy soil. So the critical depth would be coming from here, you see, not from here. So don't be confused. So critical depth, it will start from here, from the top of sandy layer. So the critical depth, if it is from here, then you could determine that how much would be the DC? That is, it is, it is, it is uh, the, 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 like this. Okay, if it is dense sand, it is dense sand over there. So if it is dense sand, the pile length is 20 meter. So 20 into D, D means it is the 0.4, so it becomes eight. So up to eight meter, this is the critical depth. After that, the vertical pressure will never increase. Would you get my point? So over here, the vertical pressure is this. So it would be, you have to consider this one as overburden pressure. Always you have to consider this one is overburden pressure because your formula is Q and Q. Your formula is Q and Q. If you see, this is actually sigma V. This is the vertical pressure. This is NQ. So this one, this vertical pressure would be equal to this mass if you use this critical depth concept. So BNBC is recommending. You can actually do the, uh, the you can use this critical depth or you could also use the in case, continuous in case but you have to use your judgment over there. Okay. Then uh, uh, it is axial capacity of driven pile. It is similar to cohesive soil. Axial capacity of driven precast pile using, this is, uh, I omit this one. It is uh, discussed, factor of safety we have discussed. Group pile and group capacity, I think you'd understand. Pile capacity, cap, lateral load capacity of driven pile. I have omitted these things over there. Eh? So these all things are over there, we, I have omitted. This one, it is effect of buoyancy, protection, deterioration, pile spacing, structural capacity, or are included, we don't have actually time. 310, it is the division B, so we have driven casting pile, shape, this sort of things, I have omitted this one over there. Then we have the geotechnical design, uh, of deep found, uh, sorry, it is uh, driven cast in situ piles, installation, concreting, structural integrity, pistols, concrete, all sort of things we have actually, uh, I didn't actually discuss over there because of time constraint. Now the geotechnical capacity of deep foundation board pile, this is actually important. So I have made some point over there. So, uh, whenever it is board pile, Whenever it is board pile, people are suggesting that skin friction, you have to, sorry, BNBC is suggesting that skin friction, you consider two-third of the skin friction of driven pile. And in bearing, you, con, uh, you consider one-third of that of driven pile. This is just a suggestion, you know. This is not shell. This is just a suggestion. 
So you could actually use also, you could also try with the global factor of safety or some other, some other factor used in the literature. Again, <coughs> this is boat by axial capacity of boat bikes in cohesive soil use SPT values. Uh, there are some uh, con uh, confusion about that one, but this is a very, very long procedure. I could not actually discuss about that. Is the is the is the is same thing on also boat pile you could use a factor of safety of two instead of, of it is uh, like this three and two third is the, the over there. This is these are the things about boat pile, all these things I didn't actually discuss it over there. Again, we have actually uh deal shaft, huh? So make sure. The, what we are doing, we could use alpha and beta method in determining the skin friction for both for uh, alpha and beta method for cohesive soil. But we have to use beta method for the determination of cohesive soil of uh, only cohesion less soil. Would you get my point? For cohesive soil, you could use both. For cohesion less soil, you have to use beta method always. But you could use the concept of critical depth or you couldn't actually use the uh, uh, concept of critical depth. That's the point. And end bearing, uh, cohesive soil is straightforward. 9 CU, okay? CU is undrained shear strength of the soil. Usually, we perform unconfined compression strength. So, from unconfined compression strength, you could get the value of undrained shear strength, CU, which is equal to QU divided by 2. If if you if are for unconfined compression test, if you get a value of 50, <coughs> sorry, get, get a value of 100 K, kPa, then CU would be equal to, <coughs> CU would be equal to 50 kPa. Could you get my point? So, so uh, uh, let me repeat. For cohesive soil, for all the piles, it could be board pile, three types of pile we are discussing. Number one, it is ribbon pile. Number two, it is board pile. And number three, it is the drill shaft. Drill shaft in American, both board pile and drill shaft are same. But in our case, we are defining a bit differently. Whenever the diameter of the board pile is more than 600 millimeter, we call it drill shaft. So for three types of foundation, deep foundation, we have three types of approach. Could you get my point? The beta being used for cohesive soil may not be the same, the beta which we are using for cohesion less soil. And the beta, also we are following it over here for drill shape, it may be also different. So that are actually given in the BNBC. So we must be very, very clear about these things. So drill shape, this the thing, okay. So we have to design uh, design uh, according to BNBC. We have to design uh, this piles for uh, working stress principle using the maximum unfactored load. We don't we don't have to use this factored load over there. So other things over there application we I have omitted there. Then geotechnical design of drill shaft. Huh? We are actually concentrating on this how to determine this capacity of drill shaft. So. It is also like this for cohesive soil alpha into SU, but there could be, there is a different alpha over here. We are suggesting alpha from this <coughs> alpha from, from this chart. So if you have undrained shear strength CU, SU or CU, you will be getting the addition factor. You, 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 you keep in mind the more the value of undrained shear strength, less is the value of alpha. Could you get my point? The softer the soil, less would be the disturb less would be the disturbance. Stiffer the soil, lot of disturbance would be there. I always, I, I always, uh, it is just kidding. I always say my student that okay, if your muscle is very strong, whenever you are putting injection, it will give a lot of pain. But if your muscle is soft, then it will give you less pain. That means. It is the less disturbance. So, in bearing, we have the different, uh, if you formalize this, we have a restriction like this. So, 
I think you could easily understand this one. So in here, if you have some belt, belt means it is sometimes the diameter of the tip diameter is larger than the pile shape in boat pile, drill shape. And in that case, you have to go for some corrections over there. Everything is mentioned over there. So beta value, you have to go for correction in cohesion less solid. It is something like this. And also, we could determine it by using this n value. So if it is n value like this, so you have the formula over here. You could use this. It is this. So th there are some methods uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned in appendix. The, the method based on standard penetration test, method based on theory of plasticity and Tomlinson method, you could actually see a look into these things. So it is about this factor of safety. Over here, it is clearly mentioned, whenever you, you will be using this drill shaft, BNBC says a factor of safety two should be zero against bearing capacity failure when the design is based on the results of load test conducted at the site. Otherwise, it shall be designed for a minimum overall factor of safety of three, three. So you can actually use this one. So these are the things uh, I didn't get actually time to. This is actually important one. Then whenever a drill shaft is in strong layer, overlying a weak layer. For example, you have a layer over there very strong, then we have a soft layer. Suddenly, the SPD value uh, actually reduces. In that case, an equivalent bearing capacity, you could consider it by using this formula. That equivalent bearing capacity should be equal to H. H is the thickness between the tip of the pile and the weak, weak layer. B prime is the reference width, which is equal to 0.3 meter. Or uh, then 10 is the, uh, this thing. So QEP, that means if this pile is resting on what is called um, a top stiff layer, the bearing capacity will be calculating it from here. From the low layer or bottom layer, we will be calculating it like this. And by using this formula, we will be getting this uh, uh, bearing capacity of uh, pile resting on uh, what is called this stiff layer. It is so 3.11 is field test for driven pile and drill shaft. Lot of inter interesting things are over here, but sorry, we couldn't actually discuss because of constraint of time. So, in in division three, we have lot of important things like excavation, construction, dewatering, de slope stability, and we have field soil. Then, if, if the if the question comes from field soil, then again we have the question of negative field friction. We could also discuss it over there. Maybe in course of uh, in course of time, if arranged, some other lecture can be uh, given on very specific issues. So uh, protective or retaining structure, waterproofing, all these things are there in C. And not only that, it is uh, what waterproofing system are there. Everything is mentioned over here. Then foundation slope, this is putting on field soil uh, ground improvement. So if you have some uh, problematic soil, definitely you have to go for uh, ground improvement. So I have actually omitted because of this time constraint. It is sorry. Uh, the soil and foundation uh, code provision for this thing, geohazard analysis, and we have actually related appendices is like this sorry so it is not appendix a it should be appendix d so we have five appendices over there d f g and h so in d we have something like methods of soil exploration choice of method sample disturbance groundwater measurement standard penetration test everything is detailed discussed over here so it is method of exploration. Everything is discussed over here. Sorry. Then we have dynamic cone penetration test, static cone penetration test. All are described in Appendix D. This is Appendix D. Sorry for the mistake. 
then we have geophysical methods that are also described. We could get actually seismic uh, velocity uh, uh, whenever we have to design this uh, foundation for earthquake loading. So, recommended for criteria for identification and classification of expansive soil. Some test results are given over there or some values are given over there. This is actually omitted. And the last one is construction of pile foundation. So, you have all these items over there. Pile driving equipment installation, pile driving leads, hammers, uh, driving procedure, noise level, etc., etc. So over here, I, I, mean, uh, I have <coughs> given a, uh, what is called this slide. Uh, sometimes we have misconception that we are driving the pile; it is not going, and we are using the heavy pile again. But mind it, driving is a dynamic procedure, and whenever this question of uh, the, the, this, this dynamic procedure comes and the, the only thing that you are increasing the weight, it, it doesn't actually uh, solve this problem. It is sometimes it is the case of resonance. If resonance happens, then maybe it would be difficult. That's why depending on this, uh, this is a chart actually provided in, in what is called this uh, BNBC 2020. From there, depending on the type of the soil, you could actually choose the type of the hammer for driving. It is also for cohesive soil, it is given over there. So, and then we have uh, uh, in Appendix F, we have construction of board cast and situ pile. Then uh, Appendix D, we have all these things, method based on standard estimating of axial capacity of lead pair. So other methods are described over here. Then we have references. So that's it. I think I am on time. Five minutes. Yeah, Professor Habedin. Um, so can you shrink your uh, PowerPoint okay. so you're able to see the question, the Q and A? Okay. Okay. So now go to your WebEx uh, app in the taskbar. Click on that. Okay. This one? Um, or this one? Okay, okay, so now go put your cursor all the way in the top. Oh, what's going on? <laughs> oh, what is happening? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> put your cursor all the way in the top of your. Oh, what's okay. going on? Then? I think it's the best answer. if he stops sharing his screen. Okay. okay. Yeah. Just stop sharing your screen, then you will see the Q and A box very easily. Okay, okay, okay. There you go. Okay. So now, do you see the Q and A? Yes. Okay. So you can go on the top. What is the critical depth of pi? Why it is used only for cohesionless soil? Oh, because whenever you are determining the skin friction. For cohesionless soil, the skin friction is a function of overburden pressure. Do you get my point? So this is a function of overburden pressure. But in case of cohesive soil, the skin friction is alpha in CU. Nothing matters over there. No question about the <coughs> overburden pressure. Is it clear to you? Yes, two questions are there. I think uh, Mani Hussain, you have made a question like this. So the, the same question is coming from Rifat. And Rifat, the second for the calculation of settlement, reinforcement, and load bearing capacity of screw pile, how to set is that which criteria should we follow? Uh, it is not actually uh, mentioned in BNBC. And again, you have to use your judgment and you have to use this literature over here. Could you get my point? So maybe in the next version, uh, uh, these things will be coming. Uh, is critical depth is referred, yeah. To determine, uh, to determine deep foundation bearing capacity, which load combination should we uh, conduct? BNBC guide us for load combination to determining bearing capacity of shallow foundation. Is it? Uh, permitted to use this uh, shallow foundation load combination to determine the deep. 
I believe it is a, a yes. Huh? I believe it is yes. I believe it is yes. Yeah. Then to evaluate the group action of closed space laterally loaded shaft is for drill shaft. Can we use this table for board pile group action calculation? Answer is no. So for for uh, drill shaft, we have actually different formula. Huh? We have different formula. Uh, if the pile tip is penetrated only two to three meter from the starting uh, of a dense sand layer, where SPT is high, <coughs> high, say 40, can we take full screen fixture and end bearing as the critical depth is not reached into the dense sand layer? So you are only uh, you are only concerned about the end bearing, you know, because. If the pile tip is penetrated only two to three feet from the starting of a dense sand layer, where SPT is high 40, can we take full screen fiction and end bearing as critical depth is not reached into the dense sand layer? Yeah, if critical depth does not reach there, okay, you could you could use this uh, uh, what is called this. Uh, 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 what is this uh, overburden pressure distribution? No problem. But as far as end bearing is concerned, <coughs> as far as end bearing is concerned, oh yeah, I understand. I understand. You could you, you don't have actually critical depth over here because it is beyond this critical depth. Okay, you you just use the linear variation. The maximum overburden you are getting at the tip that should be used for the determination of end bearing. Okay, and for skin bearing, you have actually linear, what is called this variation. Uh, Professor Abedin, yes. Um, can you read the questions because uh, the participants doesn't uh, know the questions that you're answering, so okay, it's okay. a little bit confusing no, I, for I, them. I'm actually reading the question. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm reading the question. And then Habibul Asan, are plastic sealed and clay treated similarly? for bearing capacity calculation? Answer is yes. Plastic, clay, and seal are the same thing. For sand, end bearing pile is 40 and L, L is total length uh, of pile or the critical length. It is the total length. It is the total length. For example, L, L by D, it has got a limitations. Eh? It has got a limitation if it should be 40 or something like this it is mentioned l by d maximum value is mentioned you know maximum value is mentioned for the sand n bearing of pile is 40 and 60 into l by d l is the total length of pile or critical depth it is it is not critical depth but there is a limitations of l by d if i have not forgotten it may be 10 it may be 10 or 40 10 i think it is 10 Maximum value should be 10. You can actually check. It is written over there. For sand, skin friction is 2 and 60. If the skin friction varies with depth, why factor is not introduced in skin friction equation? For sand, skin friction is 2 into n 60. If skin friction varies with depth, why the factor is not introduced in skin friction equation? So you have to take this average value. So in a way, you are considering this thing. You are taking average value. It is given n bar. If I remember, it is not n. It is the n bar. That is the average value for the whole layer. So how and when we can consider isolated footing as a fixed support? Can you explain? How and when we can consider isolated footing as a fixed support? Fixed support with the column. I cannot actually go to your question. It is Shin. I cannot actually get to your question. Okay. You can actually call me over my number. I, 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 I'd be happy to answer your question. Okay, Ume Fatima. Sir, I am 95 best student of Buet. I was a student. Okay, thank you. 
In a plot, there are five to six boreholes done and a different SPT value is observed for each of the borehole. As a result, the bearing capacity is different for each of the borehole. In this situation, how we evaluate the bearing capacity of the soil? For example, the simple average of all the boring or zoning of the area and evaluate the... No, no, no. You cannot actually go for averaging over there, you know. You have to consider the individual footing, the other one. Consider each boring log. You have to consider the proximity borehole. You know, whenever you are designing a footing, you have to co you have to use the uh, data of the nearby borehole. Okay. The other one question is coming from Asan Ullah. A building is standing for 15 years without showing any distance. By calculation based on soil test report shown that the factor of safety of shallow foundation is well below allowable limit of BNBC. In this situation, what type of soil investigation is required to, to uh, require such as triaxial drain test? Yes, triaxial drain test is. Uh, in such case, triaxial drain test show high result. This is unusual. How can I determine this soil? It is now in drain condition. So, Asanullah, the most important thing is that uh, you have to use this load one near to the in situ, in situ normal stage, other one is half, the other one is double. Otherwise, if you use some arbitrary values of normal load, it could give result like this. Could you get my point? So, I believe I could answer your question. Asanullah, is it acceptable the pile bottom is raised on clay layer? If it is clay layer, maybe you will be getting a lesser value of end bearing. Acceptable. But in that case, you have to calculate out the settlement if the clay layer is too thick. Okay. Uh, can pressure, pressure valve theory be used to calculate the bearing capacity based on SPT values? As for example, in a borehole log, this, is, this question is coming again from Jui. Jui. SE. Can pressure valve theory be used to calculate the bearing capacity based on SPT values? As for example, in a borehole log, SPT values are increasing gradually. Say our footing depth is 5 feet. While calculate bearing capacity at 5 feet should consider the average SPT value of the influence. Yes. Normally, what you have to do, you have to consider uh, the, the SPT values up to a depth of 2B. Some people says up to a depth of B. Some people says it is up to a depth of 2B. Would you get my point? So you consider these things. Professor Abedin, if you yes. want to end it now, because we're actually, oh. if you want to keep going, um, maybe 10 minutes. Okay, so, so many questions are there. Yes. <laughs> so many. We can't answer okay. all of them, but if it's up to okay. you. No, the, we can, the, the, I, I think the, we, we can you know, take a few more minutes. <laughs> we, we have gone beyond time in the past too, so, <laughs> so it's up, up to you. Okay, okay just, I, I'll take say, three questions. Okay. Okay. So sometimes in CD, this is again come, uh, came from Jui. Sometimes in CD test for clay, we get very high values of angle of internal friction, such as 35. Could you, could you explain why is there any approximate normal range of five values? I think from our discussion today about uh, these normally consolidated and over consolidated stuff, I think you will get an answer, Jui. Okay. If it is not, you could actually contact me. Eh? I, I could actually discuss it with you. It is uh, unfortunately this is not interactive, and that's why you cannot actually discuss the things. Maybe someday would be coming whenever we will be discuss all these things. The more we discuss, the more refined would be the BNBC. Uh, in this case, it, it, the question from Asanullah. In this case, can we consider end bearing capacity of soil through, through it rest on clay layer? Or we consider the skin friction only for the pile which... No, no, no. You have to consider both. You have to consider both. You have to consider both. You shouldn't think that once the skin friction is over, then end bearing is uh, coming into play. No, both are coming simultaneously. Could you? 
Okay. What is the best formula for determining bearing capacity of clay and sandy soil? It's very difficult to answer. I have shown you, I have shown you the chart of NQ. What you could do? You could use an intermediate value. You see, uh, over here, no vaccine is proven yet. Uh, can uh, can uh, clay size recommended by BNBC differs from ASTM D422? Again, in section 3.4.7, BNBC reverse ASTM standard for laboratory test. Now, which size should we use to determine the clay size particle? Uh, if it is done, I think it is a mistake. So, we should actually use the BNBC one. That clay size particle should be 0 0.002. For your information, this is actually coming from Naim Parvez. For your information, this ASTM D422 is now discontinued. It is no longer is there. Now the new new one, I think it is ASTM 69, 6937 or like this. But size particle, I think it is 0 0.002 millimeter. So this is my last answer coming from Chaudhary Mohammed Ilias. Due to fall displacement of shear band, many form. So, due to fall displacement, shear band may form in sand, in soil. Hence, it is very important to understand the shear bonding process on soil for structural failure. Structural failure, I cannot actually answer. Huh? Okay, last one. Dear sir, would you, it, is, it is actually coming from Abu Bakr Siddiq. Dear sir, would you please shed some lights on the applicability of UU, UD, CU, CD test for existing structure and new construction in Bangladesh? Uh, maybe some other time because this is a long, uh, long. Uh, it is a matter of long discussion. Okay. Okay. I believe I could actually finish it over here because lot of questions. I think 54 questions are coming. It's come. Okay, Thank you, Professor Abedin. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Professor Abedin. That was that was tremendous. <laughs> and I, I, based on the questions, I think the audience was quite knowledgeable. And I yes. concluded, I concluded that we have to somehow find a way of giving you the opportunity to present six lectures or so on geotechnical engineering <laughs> so yeah. when, when that can happen i do not know but but we have to we have to arrange for that yeah I thank you so very you. much for for <laughs> all all the trouble you have taken and no, no, it's okay okay okay, okay thank you professor okay thank you thank you everybody i'm taking actually leave so uh, uh, for, for my uh, engineers and my for, for perhaps most uh, all most of them are my students <laughs> so just if you have any confusion you just contact me there shouldn't be any problem we could discuss the things and definitely will be benefited both of us would be benefited from them okay wonderful Brother, can you take actually leave now yeah okay. yes professor so, the, thank you so Maria, much thank you Maria, sorry for that, that I have spoiled your holiday. Uh, no, no. <laughs> that's, that's all right. Okay. okay. Thank it's you. It's great having you. Okay. Oh, okay. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.